So we are going to talk about the R2D2 model today. And you know, this is not my model. I mean, people are associating this with my model, but my um, the co-author of the book, actually, her name is Dr. Ka Zhang. She's, she was at Texas Tech University, and she said, Kurt, could you talk about um, your R2-D2 model to my students down here through video conferencing about seven years ago? And I said, I have no R2-D2 model. And she said, every one of your syllabi says read, reflect, display, and do. It spells R2-D2. I said, it sure does. So I spoke to her, and then she said, let's do an article on this. And we did. And that's actually the 2006 article in the MOOC. Then she said, let's do a book. And so we did a silly book with 100 activities on it. Um, and so now people refer to this as my model. But she really coined this. So I have to thank Ka for that. Ka is at Wayne State University now. I'm trying to bring her in in the second hour for Q&A, but they're having a, a retreat today. Anyhow, we're going to call this Where Are You R2D2? Addressing Diverse Learner Needs with the Read, Reflect, Display, and Do model. Now, R2D2 could be looked at as a learning style model, but I'm an educational psychologist by training, and we don't believe in learning styles. And I noticed Laura's blog post or Twitter post saying she doesn't believe in learning styles either. Well, you know, some people do. And, and if you do, you can use it that way. Some people will look at this as an instructional design model. But I don't really see it as an instructional design model. Uh, but you can use it that way. I think it's a way to address diversity in the classroom. And it's also a way in which to divide up the Internet into four things you can do. Reading activities, reflective writing, visualization, and hands-on doing. And it's a problem-solving wheel, as we'll come to see. So you can use it in many different ways, but it's a way to reduce frustration. Some of you post you're frustra frustrated. It's a way to reduce that and feel a little more confident in your teaching. So that's why we designed R2D2. It's not that we're trying to create another learning style model or um, learning preferences model or instructional design model. I'll let other people do that. You know, I'm listed in, in Wikipedia as an instructional designer, but I don't even believe in instructional design, OK? So whoever wrote that Wikipedia post, please take my name off of that. Um, <laughs> you got to be careful. I sometimes am facetious, but I really don't. Uh, anyhow, poll number 21. Do you have any trouble keeping up with technology news? Yes or no? Is, is your mind going numb? Do you need a new brain in your head? We got brains here in Bloomington on display. I don't know about 30 brains we got in Bloomington? Something like that. 22 brains, Mang Wan said. OK, hold up. 22. 22. OK, 22. OK, so most of you are frustrated. You know, when we've got announcements like the Chronicle of Higher Ed, or the Guardian in the UK, or was it University Business or something up there in Canada, you know, they have a digital special issue on a guy teaching 2,670 students from Virginia Tech. We've got 3,675 people signed up in this class, according to Sarah Bishop Root. Thank you, Sarah. You know, we've got all this stuff to keep track of. We've got yak herders in Mongolia taking classes from Yale online, my goodness. You know, and articles on that. Just in the past week, we got new announcements from MIT and Harvard that they're going to offer free classes. <laughs> They think they discovered something new, and they're going to kick in $60 million to do so. I didn't get $60 million for doing this. Got a few million, but you know, not enough. And it, keeping track, and there's a nice little video with this one explaining the, the new initiative called edX. Uh, Terry X is coming from Canada, right, Terry? We've got Shaquille O'Neal getting his doctorate from Berry University in Florida, a Catholic university. When Shaquille O'Neal gets his doctoral degree through online learning, and he got his master's through blended learning from Phoenix, when Oprah Winfrey teaches 2 million people online and 600,000 simultaneously, people are yawning at all this stuff. Back when Terry and I were in the trenches 10, 20 years or more ago doing this, this was front page news. Today we're yawning at all this. But times are changing. And so that's May 5th, right? 
And we had announcements yesterday, other ones. I mean, every day there's new things happening that we have to keep track of and we're overwhelmed. So tech variety that I presented last week is one framework, one way of cutting the slice into 10 pieces or thinking about your instruction with these 10 principles of motivation. If you incorporate six or seven or eight in a thoughtful, reflective manner, I think you'll enhance instruction. I think you'll increase retention. I did in my own classes. I've seen others do it as well around the world. This is, the, this is not the only model. This is one way of thinking about instruction online, one way of thinking about diverse learners, one way of thinking about um, engagement, active learning, retention, and so forth. This week, we're going to flip to a simpler model just called R2D2. And it's a problem-solving wheel, if you will. So these are two mnemonics, yeah, Adam, two different mnemonic tools or aids. In my World is Open book, I have a model or mnemonic called We All Learn. So this is a simple one. Reading, auditory, reflection, displaying, and doing. Now, I say that none of us educational psychologists believe in learning styles. However, all instructors that I know find this valuable or tools for learning styles valuable to reflect on your teaching. Learning style instruments are practical. They don't hold theoretical grounding just like the Myers-Briggs inventory doesn't and most psychological constructs lack it. But these are valuable as teaching tools. So don't give up on learning styles or instructional design or motivational principles because it may lack validity and reliability as a construct, as a psychological construct, if it can impact your teaching, if it can make your class more engaging and hmm, learner-centered or, I guess, to create a learning environment that's rich and engaging, then by all means you should think about using these. There are battles in my class over all this, of course. You know, I can take out my lightsaber and my assistants have their lightsabers as well. And we have battles in our classes, right, Meng Wan? You know, and we do. We've got, we've got constant battles taking place. <laughs> and so, <laughs> it's quite a fun place here at Indiana. Come on, study over here. Anyhow, <laughs> I don't have my costuming with me here today, but, but we do have fun with things here, even eat cake during the midst of these battles. But read, reflect, display, and do, or R2D2 is one slice, one way. <laughs> yeah, bring your eight-year-olds into the MOOC. Bring your seven-year-olds into CP3O. Okay, we've got more models. Well, we're going to start with the first section, and that's auditory learning. So let's look at auditory learning, people preferring words, spoken um, information in podcast format, explanations in Blackboard or Moodle or Desire to Learn or Angel or whatever it is you're using, announcements in Twitter, announcements in the course management system, uh, wikis that you might be using. Uh, my Twitter handle is Travelin Edman, and my blog is Travelin Edman as well. No G on Travelin, like the Travelin Wilburys. And so this is phase one. So you see that first quadrant up there on your screen? You see that right there? Phase phase one, right there. Yeah, look right there. Okay? Yeah. Right 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 over there. And so we're gonna move from phase one and into some activities here. Reading activities. You might assign people wiki books. My students write wiki books with students from Beijing Normal in China. In three hours I'll be presenting to Beijing Normal, in fact, I think. Um, we do books with students in Malaysia, at the Open U of Malaysia, in Taiwan, at Indiana State University, um, all over the world, Finland, Korea, UK. We're writing books together. We're critiquing. My colleagues at Houston, at the University of Houston, we first critiqued a wiki book from George Ori at the University of Georgia on learning theories. Then we edited a wiki book from Indiana Wesleyan here in this lovely state of Indiana. Then we wrote our own wiki book. Dr. Mimi Lee at Houston, Grace Lynn at the University of Hawaii, and myself, we studied this. My student, Nari Kim at Oshkosh, we studied wiki books, and they're not easy. If anyone's interested in building wiki books, I can send you articles on the pros and cons and what you can do. But 
reading, editing, critiquing, all text, all words, open source software, Terry's journal there, the International Review of Research in Open and Distance Ed, a great journal, open access, it's free, take a look at it. They have articles a couple months ago on MOOCs and, you know, um, their most recent issue is fascinating as well. They've had special issues on open source, on e-learning in Asia. But the Public Library of Science, journals in genetics and in biology, or the Educause Quarterly or Review, open access. My 54-page syllabus on, how to, uh, on, on my World is Open class is, is all available online as a free free course, in effect. I mean, 54 pages, it's all free stuff. There's nothing you have to buy. Open access articles are something that have exploded. Why not use them for people who like text? Some people like to read. Give them choice in the text. I give them six articles. You pick three every week. Give announcements like David Perry does at the University of Texas at Dallas. Give announcements up there on how the class is going or new resources that you're using. For me, my Facebook updates go to my Twitter feeds. Have people listen to podcasts. If you're teaching military history like they do in um, King's College in London, or if you're teaching nursing like at Ball State, which is all online, or IUPUI, or other places in the world, or English, podcast shows, text-based learners, right? Glossaries. One of my students last uh, semester, she said, Dr. Bonk, I don't want to just do a regular text-based glossary. I want to make mine interactive and add in videos. So she, she did more than text. She made an interactive glossary to people who we were reading about, but extended beyond the reading to the display side. So some methods in R2D2 are crossing multiple phases. And you don't have to start with reading. You can start with reflection. You can start with hands-on doing. And you can go in the opposite direction. So Omita's interactive glossary just blew me away. And I'm going to use it next time. She spent so much time on this, but she knew every concept that she was linking to on the web, people would be using later in later years. Um, portals, databases. Some of my students create databases of the articles for the class. And that gets updated every semester for text-based learners. Some of my students like online crossword puzzles to practice their concept attainment. Students want to know if they know the content. So like last week when I presented Tech Variety Model, there were many learner, learner content interactions, learner machine interactions, getting feedback from the computer if you got it right. So the instructor isn't the only one grading papers. If you're the only one grading papers, you will die. If you're the only one giving feedback to students online, you will die. Get peer feedback, critical friends. Get expert feedback, self-feedback, system feedback. Paul has died. Lynn has no slide. <laughs> that rhymes. <laughs> so 1G is crossword puzzles, OK? Uh, and there are many tools, Eclipse Crosswords 1. Talking dictionaries. A couple months ago, the Wall Street Journal had a special issue on these talking dictionaries that are being put together to save culture, to save languages around the world. And they had an interactive map showing where these different places around the world, uh, where they were saving languages, including in the US in Oklahoma, including in the US in Seattle, and up in Vancouver, up near Terry, actually, up that way. He's up in Edmonton area. In si Siberia, or Eastern Siberia, or in South America, or in Southern Africa. Languages need to be preserved. And one way we can do it is with web-based technologies. And now we can use that for our online classes in cultural studies, online classes in history. A new tool which got seven to eight million dollars of venture capital is called Piazza. And I've talked to the vice president of Piazza lately, and it seems they're exploding in terms of use. It's a free tool to post questions up as a class progresses, students can answer the questions. Other instructors can answer the questions. It's kind of a flat, higher, uh, flat discussion forum, not like a hierarchy like we see typically. So you get more learner-centeredness, more interaction, Piazza, okay? Q&A online. So though that's just going through the reading side of this. So my polling question here is, 
do you think students prefer the reading part of R2D2? Yes, maybe, no, not sure. What do you think? Polling question right underneath that. We've got questions coming in here. Okay, one person saying there's no slideshow, so maybe we need to have another poll after this as to whether you can see the slides or not, but hang on a second. There's a couple people. If you don't see the slides, you might want to exit out and come back in. Ross has no slides. Okay. So maybe and not no and not sure. Okay. Most people say maybe for the reading side. Let's ask a second question. Let's go to a ch uh, yes, no. Yes would be, um, uh, let's go to a yes, no kind of format here, Haziz, and uh, clear that one out. And um, let's go, yes, you can see the slides. No, you cannot. There's a couple of people who cannot. For those of you who can't see the slides, some of you, they came back for you. Okay, good. Okay. If, they have, if you haven't gotten them for like five minutes or so, you might exit out and come back in. That would be one solution I can think of. A second solution would be to try another computer. A third solution is additional patients. And a fourth solution is you can um, just get my, my uh, slides themselves off of the Blackboard MOOC. And you can actually ask me. I've, I can let you download them. Here's a color PDF of my slides if you want to get them. OK. So the majority are OK. Let's go to the second part. Phase 2. You see that phase 2 right over there? Yeah, phase 2. All right. Enough of the antics, right? Uh, we should go back here and read what phase two is. Observational learners, reflective learners, viewing. I'm currently reading the book, or actually listening in my car to the book Quiet, about introverted people. They reflect, they observe, they view. How many of you would consider yourself an introverted learner? Yes or no? Yes or no? Introverted would be a yes. No would be not introverted. And I guess if you know me, I guess I got to go with the no vote there. <laughs> Mong Wan, what do you think? Am I introverted or extroverted? <laughs> All right. So this is interesting. Majority of people in this session right here, 118 people out of 156 are considered themselves introverted. Okay. And we've got 327 people with us here today. 156 have not yet voted. You can still vote. Uh, last week we had 500 or so. It's good to have 300 and some come back. That's great. That's great. Um, reflective learners, blogging, reflection. My friends in the military in Norway right now at the ADL conference are reflecting tonight. Some of them are blogging and sending me notes. My friend Major Tom, I don't know if Major Tom has joined us. Ground control, are you with us, Major Tom? Can you hear us, Major Tom? Anyhow, he's in Norway, in Gul, Norway, and they're reflecting on the day's conference in their blog posts, individual blogging on articles that you might have read in the class. Terry blogs, I blog, others blog. And if you want feedbacks, assign critical friends with common interests, perhaps, or maybe a shy with an extroverted person, or a confident with a less confident. I sometimes meet my online students for one day, and I line them up non-verbally from most confident to least confident, and the most confident gets matched up with the least confident as critical friends. Okay, that's one way to do it. There are other ways. But if you're the only one giving feedback, and believe me, students want feedback on everything they do online, if you do it, you will die. I don't want you to die. So get critical friends, get web buddies, get email pals, get uh, practitioners giving feedback, self-feedback. OK, polling question, do you have a blog, yes or no? Let's clear out that last one. Let's clear that out, yes or no, do you have a blog? Just yes or no, we have a yes or no here. It's the wrong format, I think, yes or no. Not a four-point format yet, there we go. Yes or no, let's try that over. Okay. Go ahead and post that one. Let's clear that one off and go to the second question. 
Have you ever created a video blog? Yes or no? Okay, you can post that one. Most people have not. Let's go to the third question. Do you regularly read other people's blogs? Yes or no? So we've got bloggers somewhat, not the majority, definitely not video bloggers. We have readers of blogger, blogs in the room here. Uh, quite a few, almost evenly split, but more yes than no. Okay, let's go, to the, let's go to the fourth one here. And do you assign blogging tasks in your classes, yes or no? Or have you been, if you've never taught a class, have you taken any classes that assign blogs? Interesting. Okay. Some people are skipping the answer to that. Steve Madonna is with us, another great name. Okay. Interesting responses. Let's go on to reflective learners. You can assign your students to reflect on expert blog posts. They don't have to be the ones blogging. How about finding other people's stuff? Instead of you teaching everything, how about using free content on the web from experts? Supplementing your classes with blogs of Terry Anderson or other experts around the world. That would be a good thing, I think, or a valuable thing to do in a class. At least think about These are things to think about. Maybe try one or two of these ideas. Cultural blogs. Come and see Africa.com. Yes or no? Has anyone seen this blog? This is from my friend Kim Foreman. Now, Kim called herself my big sister. She went to graduate school with me at Wisconsin. She did missionary work in Africa, in Kenya and Rwanda with her husband. He's a priest or a whatever, in a, in, a, in a church out in um, California, in San Francisco. She was chair at San Francisco State University of Instructional Technology. And a year and a half ago, she was thrown from a car. We can post the results there. And she died. She didn't have her seat, a seatbelt. And so her Come and See Africa blog is still there. I can use it in my talks. Many of you haven't seen this, but you can use it in your classes. Kim is alive and well. My big sister's still out there somewhere in her blog. Pictures, videos they've done, reflections on graduation or whatever it is. Okay? What you post today might be usable tomorrow. What you think of today might be used in a century. Your digital history is alive for digital archaeologists of two, three centuries from now. Workplace reflections. Since 1996, I've been having my pre-service teachers reflect on the field uh, during their internships. They link Piagetian theory to their field experience. They link Vygotsky to my lectures, to the book, to their internship and the questions that we're asking. Reflective learners, giving them questions that they might ask. Now, my, my TAs in this class, my interns like you are over here, she's posting questions in the MOOC for you to answer. So you'll be looking and she's, she's going to post some hard ones, she told me. Scenario-based learning. Having people go through a set of, maybe it's, it's um, sales training. Maybe it's uh, military tactical operations. Maybe it's uh, ethics or sexual harassment training, like on the left there from MS Communications. Whatever it is, scenarios. You might be doing time-revealed scenarios where pieces of scenario are revealed over time. Here in Bloomington, Option 6 is a company designing these scenarios, and Wisdom Tools is another one. Krispy Kreme, you go through a video or a set of still images about Krispy Kreme, and then answer some questions. Reflect on those. You might have cases on the web, like at the Kelly School of Business at IU, the KD program. Cases with a marketing manager, a CFO, a CIO, an EIEIO. And you have all this information that you condense and synthesize to make decisions on these online cases. You might have a video with the case. You might have a reflection transcript with the case or an animation. So any light bulbs going on so far? Yes, no, or maybe. And we're at a point where Hafiz is going to be moving us to a net second set of slides, I believe, out of three sets. We're, about, we're a little less than halfway through here. And we've taken about a half hour. So, poll here. Go ahead and answer that poll. Are the light bulbs going off in your head? Any light bulbs? Where are my light bulbs? I'm missing my light bulb. Here's my light bulb. 
light bulbs going off in your head. While we're doing that, in the chat window, if you are from Europe, what's one idea? Only people from Europe type in the chat window. What's one idea you may have gotten so far? And Aviz is going to upload the new slides, right, Aviz? You can take these away. Go ahead and upload the new ones, Aviz. How to use Wikibooks. Thank you. Using Wikipedia. Thank you, Lori. Michael Deschler is with us. Are you from Australia? How can you be typing from <laughs> with the Europeans? Okay. Blogging. All right. Let's go to Africa or South America. We don't have many people from Africa or South America. Go ahead and type in. So I'll go for, with both of you. Anyone from Africa or South America would like to type in? How would you? How, what ideas? Blogs, case studies, okay. Let's put a yes, no poll up there, um, Haviz, um, so we can get a yes, no poll in here. Wiki books, okay, case studies. Let's go to Mexico. Anyone from Mexico, what might you use? And um, video blogging, okay. Blogging, thank you, Maria, Luis, Wikis, okay. I know we have a lot of people from Mexico. Hello, my friends in Mexico. How about Canada? Any Canadians with us other than Terry? Go ahead, Terry, or anyone else from Canada. Oh, Canada, get out your maple leaves. Hockey's going on, so I don't know if we can get away from hockey. Blogging in Piazza, okay. Screen sharing, all right. Wiki books. Okay, actually, the Wikipedia people have created wiki books. You can also create wiki books in wiki spaces. Let's go to North America. What might you use? Anyone from North America with us? Critical friends, blogging. Actually, maybe we should start with the South in North America. People in the South, start with the South. Southern states. Southern man. Southern man. Let's go to the South. Come on, let's go to the South. <laughs> Come on, honey. <laughs> Video blogging, journals, okay, Florida, blogging, all right. Let's go to the west of the USA, out west, anywhere out west. Scenario learning, evaluations, great. Wiki discussion, Piazza, all right. Blackboard, flip classrooms. Let's go to the east. Northeast in particular, but anywhere on the East Coast. If you haven't responded yet, you could be from the Southeast. If you already responded, don't. Crossword puzzles, Piazza, okay, expert blogging, right. Critical friends, scenarios, a lot of Piazza people. Hmm. First in, first out, last in, first out. How about Midwest? All my friends here in the Midwest. Okay, Ed, all your friends in Illinois. Sorry, Maria, your friends in Arizona got to be quiet at this point. Julie, good to have you here from e University of Indianapolis. Interactive glossary. Good deal. Kansas. Hey, let's move on here. Why don't we have everyone go ahead and type um, if you're from the U.S., because we've had people from other cities, if you're from the U.S., what city are you from or state or city and state? Just any place in the U.S. Go ahead and type where you're from. Wow. Wars, Wausau, Wisconsin. Good place for insurance companies. Chico, Champaign, Williamsburg, Colonial. I was there a year ago today. I was in Colonial Williamsburg meeting George Washington. Okay, Frankfort, Kentucky, another good place. Jupiter, Florida, Indianapolis. Let's go. If you're from anywhere else in the world other than U.S., where are you from? What city and country, please? Anywhere around the world, London, Toronto, France, Iceland. <laughs> good, Guelph. Ecuador. Viva la France. Mexico, Egypt. Someone's asking if I've been to Egypt. I, I, I love Egyptian history. I just keep the wrong times I've been asked to help out there in Egypt. Sorry about that. So I haven't been able to help out in Egypt. I wish I could during this massive open online class help in, in Egypt, but um, 
Korea, Myung's, he hung with us. She took me to the DMZ a few months ago and dropped me off, left me there for dead. Okay, <laughs> visual learners. Some people prefer visuals. I'm a visual learner, right? Some of you are visual learners. So you'll, you'll prefer this third section. Timelines, pictures, films, demonstrations, right? We'll get you in that third quadrant right there, right? Right there. Okay, let's go back in time. So we've got Sung Kwang Wan University, the oldest university in Korea, offering videos for clinical education. Samsung owns this medical university. Okay, they're, they're palaces galore in this place. It's a fabulous place. I got to spend time there in September. But they have great instructional designers there. KJ Kim, a former student of mine and others, medical animations in YouTube showing gastric bypass surgery, something I don't want to experience anytime soon, but maybe someday. Human embryology. My daughter took this class at IU a few summers ago on human anatomy. She said, Dad, I'm taking Valerie O'Loughlin's class and they have these animations on the web and so I can self-test if I know the content and I know I'm going to do good on this exam. My daughter goes to Butler and she took her last class yesterday. She graduates this weekend, but every summer she comes to IU. I said, I know about that. Valerie's been to my class. She has this great set of animations anyone can use. There's a professor at Penn State who has a set of muscular system websites up and everyone's using it, thousands and thousands of people. I think I had it up last week. Radical cartography, seeing Chicago, Ed, and the ethnicities in Chicago, or seeing Boston, and that, you know, if Lisa Neal's with us, looking at Boston grow over the past couple of centuries. Radical cartography, visualizing data online, seeing data in the World Mapper tool, a database of databases of science growth, of pancreatic cancer deaths, primary education spending. Go to the World Mapper and look at the U.S. and how much it spends on education compared to India or China. Look at the U.S. in science growth, very thin compared to Asia and Europe. Look at America compared to other countries in cancer deaths. It's a fantastic free tool, like this one yesterday in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Yesterday, I'm scouring through the Chronicle, looking at the percent of people with college degrees by county. And you can see in Merrill, in uh, Massachusetts there, Middlesex, Massachusetts, one of the highest, right? One of the highest explosions in the world of degrees. But if you click along that bar at the top, you see that little bar at the top, that red, it by, by decade. If you click along and go back in time, you'll see not many people had degrees 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, okay? So some of you are still waiting for the slides to catch up, I see. So I'm going to talk a little slower here for a second as these slides come back. I'll wait for them to, to come up. So yeah, hands rolling, Rosling. He does all these interactive maps with data. Today you can help your students learn through having this kind of data set, right? Let's go back to a yes-no question. Can you see this interactive map display 3F, yes or no? So I know people are following along with me. Looks like about 122 can and 27 cannot, so we're having a little time in which the system's winding through this set of slides on part two. Okay. Let me know in the chat window when they start to appear. What's happening, I think, is that newsrooms, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardian, the Chronicle of Higher Ed, uh, today the St. Louis Dispatch called me. They put their news up and they create timelines on things. They create interactive interactivities of the Enron crisis. They create interactivities of college costs and how much it is. Okay, so you, you can see some of these slides. Let me go to the next one. Interactive maps. The um, U.S. Department of Agriculture sponsored a website that shows climate change across the U.S. and how the growing season has changed over the past couple of decades. So you can see in Illinois there, Ed. You can see in Indiana here and over in Ohio. Any Ohio people with us here? We can see things. Uh, in terms of growing seasons, right? We can see changes happening through these interactive maps. 
You can look at graduation rates by county, by state, by country. We have people in London. We have people in France. We have people in Seoul. We have people in Sydney here today. I'm just showing. This is just yesterday's news. I, I normally don't just show U.S. stuff, but you can see how low graduation rate is in Alaska, in Idaho, in Louisiana, in Arkansas, and in Kentucky some of the lowest in the country. We have Frankfurt, Kentucky with us. You know the situation there. Indiana, not much better in terms of college graduation. We can get these interactive maps that can display how it's changed over the century. We can get these interactive maps to show where the students are coming from. Why is it so low? Right. Okay, compared to maybe in France or in London or somewhere else, right? Okay. Download and use all these websites. You can go to Google SketchUp and get maps of the world. You can get stadiums in Sydney where rugby's played or Australian rules. You can get stadiums like BC Place in Vancouver or points of interest like the Louvois or the Golden Gate Bridge for art classes, architecture classes, weather animations online, depicting Hurricane Ike or Hurricane Katrina before it happened, seeing and visualizing meteorologically related data. Now in 1995 I had a project called Blue Skies where students in Indiana, rural southern Indiana, worked with Indianapolis inner city kids and suburban Park Tudor kids becoming meteorologists with Chris Wright from Channel 11 here in, in Indiana. Um, they were doing all sorts of barometric pressure and wind and, and, uh, and temperature and all sorts of activities uh, with students around the world, adventure around the world. Wordles, Jarl had a Wordle up on me to start this class. You can put a Wordle up in, 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 in on my syllabi or on articles in Terry, Terry's journal, International Research, uh, uh, Review of Research on Open and Distance Learning, IRRODL. Wordles are ways to depict or see ideas come to life, concept maps, timelines, taxonomies, and Wordles now help thought come on paper. You can see thought. Some people is multitasking with two iPads simultaneously. <laughs> okay. Visual bones. Any Idaho people? This, this professor over in Idaho, I think University of Idaho, created a virtual zoo archaeology website for, art, for um, vertebrates in northern um, North America. So you can see birds, mammals, and fish in 2D and 3D displayed, all free to the world. You can see civil rights movements from the University of Georgia and other websites that have been put up with marches, civil rights marches from the 60s and 70s. Jimmy Carter being interviewed as governor of Georgia, Bobby Kennedy and others, police records, CIA records, um, you name it, it's up in some of these historical portals, maps. You can see my brother being interviewed two months ago, three months ago on WTMJ in Milwaukee. He's losing his job from Frontier Airlines. Boom, it's up on the web and I'm watching my brother lose his job. I mean, every day there's something on the web that we can incorporate into our lives and into our classes. Okay, poor Richard. If anyone has a job for, for him, let me know. He, you know. he could use one right now. Um, anyways, I'm sure he'll work hard for you. But my point is, and in two weeks I'll talk about video. I'll talk about how to use video in your classes or how to use timelines like the timelines the USA Today and Washington Post and Toronto. What's the Toronto paper, uh, paper um, Terry? It's a good paper. I'm just blanking on it right now. Something just star. Thank you very much. Yeah, great paper. They have these timelines up like Martin Luther King's life. And as you click on the timeline, you find out about things of his life. You find out about Steve Jobs' life when he passed away the day after he passed away. They had his whole life on a timeline. Bill Gates, last week I showed you on a timeline. These are ways to put thought on paper, to interact with thought, to play with thought, to juxtapose one thought or one timeline against another. I've been to this memorial twice in six months and I went to the timeline first. Go to the virtual timelines. Go to the virtual tours of Oxford before going to J.R. Tolkien's homes in Oxford. I'm going to the virtual tour of Newfoundland before I went to Newfoundland a couple of years ago. I met Terry actually in Newfoundland. There was, uh, Terry may not know this, but I went to the virtual tour of Newfoundland first. A helicopter ride over the top. I can go to Brian Ford's work from the UK. Now Brian, I mentioned last week, is the world's smartest man, head of Mensa in the UK. 
He's uh, he's a, a BBC TV on radio personality. He has a new theory of dinosaurs, a new theory of um, the intelligence of a single cell and secret weapons of Nazi Germany. Well, his whole life's on the web in video. 40 years of microbiology up on the web for biology classes to use. Students can track the life of a scientist up on the web. People can look at art online. Google has the interactive art project on the web. Okay? The nightly news from Google. We've got encyclopedias up online. The encyclopedia of the earth free, peer-reviewed. If you don't like wiki species, which is not peer-reviewed, you might go to the Encyclopedia of Life or the Encyclopedia of the Earth and you get 2.7 million species known to humankind that's peer-reviewed. Do activities wrapped around these uh, websites. Blend your classes with this rich media, these videos online. We've heard of TED Talks, technology, entertainment, design. There's now TED-Ed little snippets of these 20-minute talks, five-minute snippets, two-minute snippets you can use in your classes. Okay? So educational videos to reflect and see and watch. Okay? Prezi, I'll come back to Prezi. Someone's using Prezi there. Um, we'll, we'll get back to Prezi. This is new. Ted's actually hiring people to make these snippets up. Concept mapping tools like Bubble.us and finally, finally, Inspiration is made available on the web in beta format, I think. I've been waiting for two decades, but it's there. You've got CMAP and FreeMind. CMAP came from Western Florida U. People spun out a company. MindMeister, MindDomo, thought on paper, seeing your ideas juxtaposed against someone else's or Chapter 3's ideas against Chapter 4. Looking at macro propositions and micro propositions and the connections and the causalities. My friend Major Tom sent me this last month. He has a website that they use for training in the military in, in uh, Sweden called The Planet. And you can go to The Planet and you can get information about the Earth, information about air, information about life, information about fire, information about water. And as you click along, you get different act interactivities that explain coal or explain what is it there in northern uh, Alberta there, Terry, where they're, uh, uh, they're going to oil sands, right? What's that city in the tar sands getting all the oil out? Uh, what's that big city up there that makes $200,000 a year? Mc, Fort McMurray, yeah. Well, it explains all that in this one simple concept map. Basically, this one concept map, the planet, explains all life. Lesson plans on iPads. Some of you are talking about iPads. How do you bring Ted Ed to your Blackboard classes? You put, put the links in Ted Ed into your um, uh, links. And Sarah, you might answer this question as well. Anita, embed the link. Thank you, Anita, from Houston. Uh, lesson plans. There's a new tool called Show Me, where you can put a lesson plan like the Khan Academy. You can create a lesson plan for your kids in your classes in math, or in reading, or in geographies, or whatever it happens to be that you're teaching, and send it to them to see that lesson and repeat it over and over. And as they've learned it, they can put their learning up in Poplet, a knowledge building and sharing tool like a concept mapping tool, but it has embedded links. And so you can click on a link and go to the article. You can click on the ideas and go to the article up in Poplet. Very, very, very cool tool that some of my students are using today. Timeline tools, University of North Texas have had this up there a number of years. Now, Yua, have you used this? Meng Wan, have you used this tool? No, I don't think she's used it. Um, it's timelines of, of Bill Clinton's life, timelines of you know, we might have George Bush Sr. or Jr. But not only North Texas has this, and as you click along the timeline, you get interactivities, you get information. But you can also go to federal government websites on presidents from the 1700s, well, 1800s, 1900s, and today, right? All the way up through Obama and maybe beyond. These are interactivities that maybe they have in France for your presidents. I guess you got a new president. You're going to have to fix that timeline. Okay? And you might have you know, a new president, I think. You know, oh, no, I think you voted for that woman in Australia again, right? In Korea, you're always getting rid of your presidents and getting a new one. Um, just kidding there. <laughs> maybe they want a new one right now, I think. <laughs> National Geographic, a timeline of history, of prehistory. So you look across this interesting interactive timeline and as you look across it, you can get information about animals and plants, 
of, you know, about first humans. So National Geographic, the Smithsonian, and others have put this stuff up on the web. And you know, as we have this stuff, you can, you can become your own R2-D2, right, kind of person. And you can be getting your students into phase three. So it's not just phase one that's important, phase two, reading and reflection. Phase three, visualizing the learning process. That, to me, is what's important today. So we might move to part four, and we're going to have a break here in a second for the very end here. We're almost done, but we couldn't fit the last bit on here. Kinesthetic learners, hands-on learning, simulations, movements, manipulatives, phase four of the model. Okay? So we've gone from phase one over there, phase two, now we're on phase four. Okay? So let's go take a look at phase four, the first activity, podcast shows. My students do a weekly reflection in a blog, or they do a weekly podcast show. It's their choice. Giving students choice with all this stuff online is critical. Have them be producers of content, not just receivers of content. You want them out there putting and generating things into the web 2.0, as Terry said. Have them be someone who's doing something with web content, not just someone who's receiving and browsing and sleeping on that stuff. Well, I guess we're in phase four. I have to switch my glasses back off. I couldn't see with those anyway, so that's OK. <laughs> so we're going to move to the third set of slides, a very quick set of slides. The first question in polling before we, we're switching over, do you listen to a podcast on a regular basis, yes or no? Do any of you listen to a podcast on a regular basis? OK. Most people don't. Interesting. 125 said no. 46 said yes. How about, have you created a podcast, yes or no? Let's clear that one out. Let's actually, we should post that one first. Let me go in and um, polls, and um, let me make the responses. There we go. And now I'll clear that one out. Have you created a podcast, yes or no? Let's go back and try over again. Okay, and um, I will post that. I think I know how to do that. Well, okay, there it is. And I'll clear that one out as well. And has anyone here created a video uh, podcast or what's called a vodcast? And I'll go ahead and post those as well. I think I thought I did. We've got 126 saying no. 62 said yes. So we got a lot of people in this audience today who have done that. Wow. Okay, and I've created videos. What's the difference? Um, well, a video podcast is a, I guess, a video f audio file first. What's the difference? That's a good question. <laughs> Someone want to answer that question? Does it have to have an RSS feed? No, I don't think it has to have an RSS feed. Podcasts are just audio, but audio with a video. I make videos. The demos podcasts are produced regularly. The length of time saved in MP4 format. Podcast is video audio combo. My lectures are vodcast, OK. Aziz, let's get that last set of slides up here if you can. And while he's doing that, from this last section, if you are from Africa, Asia, or South America, could you write down one idea or two ideas from the last section that you might use? Africa, Asia, or South America. Let's th yeah. timelines. iPads and mind mapping, 
timelines in podcasting. Okay, podcasting, poplets. George, thank you, George. Irene, pod, uh, vodcast. Mark is with us. Mark Kircher is with us. Vodcasting. It is 1:05 there in Dubai, Mark. Um, one of the funniest men on the planet. If you get to Dubai, he will take you around. Case closed. Anyone here wants a friend? So if you want friends, here's a friend you can have. Yeah, I should probably put his email. Mark, put your email up there so everyone has it. Dubai, yeah. He needs he needs to take people around. He's lonely there in Dubai. <laughs> He'll even find a pub. Greetings from ADL. Is that Major Tom at ADL? It is Major Tom from ADL Lab. Good to have you with us, Major Tom. I've been talking about you here tonight. Um, if you're from Australia, what's one idea? So let's expand. We've had Europe. Go ahead. If you haven't posted from Europe, Australia, we've got Joe, Timeline. So Australia, South America, Asia, or Australia, New Zealand. So we've got almost everybody out there. Poplets and idio infographics. Okay. Now, if you are from Mexico or Canada, go ahead and post in there. Mexico or Canada, TED Talks, screen flows, poplets, timelines, TED Ed, podcasts. There's a typo on the right side. Yeah, there is. <laughs> I caught that one a long time ago, but I, my graphic artist left me. Maria, podcasts, Aziz, timelines. Jason Harden's joined the session. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Zhang Wan has joined the session. Thanks for joining us, Zhang Wan. The question right now is, Zhang Wan, from the second part, we're moving to part three here in a second. Um, what's one idea from part two that you can use? And Zhang Wan, we should all give her a round of applause. She got tenure recently at Auburn University, and she's a former student in my program. Give her a big round of applause, yeah. Big congrats to her. If you're from the south of the U.S., what's one idea you can use? South U.S., what's one idea you can use? Poplets, interactive maps, mind mapping, mapping, maps, poplets, interactive timelines. The poplet's kind of a cool little tool. My, my TA in this class, Kim Sieber, told me about it. And I think um, Kelly, who's coming in, told me about it. Show me, voice threads. Mapping, okay. So we've done reading, reflecting, displaying, and started on the doing side. If you're from the East Coast, go ahead and type in. East Coast people. Ted Ed, Poplets, Lance said. Uh, Fred, simulations. Mary, I missed that one. I'm back on Mary. <laughs> what about Mary? <laughs> I think there should be a movie with that name. Vodcast, thank you, Mary. Student Clouds. How about West Coast people? West Coast, if you haven't typed, go ahead and type, even on the East Coast. Concept mapping, vodcasts, wordles, bubble.us, pearl trees, Camtasia. How about Midwest people? How about anyone near the Great Lakes, even if you're from Canada again, Toronto area, Winnipeg? Anyone here in the Midwest? Kansas people, go ahead and type in. Okay, great. Let's take a poll here. Can you see the slide? It says 4B Wikibooks. We're almost done here. Take a poll. 43 say yay. 59, 65 say yes. One says no. I think we're good to go. Creative Commons timelines. So now we're moving to part four of the R2D2 model. So let's see what we got here in part four. Wikibooks. If you haven't taken a look at a wiki book, it's kind of a cool thing. We did one on the web 2.0 about four years ago that we keep updating. Students from around the world have written chapters on all sorts of things, um, on ebooks, on personalized learning, on podcasts, on wikis. It's free in the Wikibooks website. And if your book gets popular, they put it on the bookshelf. And there's over a thousand books up in Wikibooks. We've been studying our um, what, what motivates people to put things up, what their frustrations are, what their supports are, 
how constructivistic is the nature of a Wikibook project. We've been looking at uh, identity in the Wikibook. We've looked at how many Wikibooks people are doing. Uh, planning tools in a Wikibook, all sorts of things. We also have a typo in the practice of learning theories, the PULT, which is a learning theories book that we built after seeing Michael Ory's book at Georgia, students at Indiana and the University of Houston, Dr. Mimi Lee's class again and mine worked together to do that. And we've got a couple articles. If you want my articles, I'll send them to you. Write me an email. Motivation is everything. Yes. Thank you for that reminder, Patty. Motivation is <laughs> everything. Some people need money. Other people don't. My friend Ron Ostin at York University, I think Terry knows Ron. Good guy there, Ron. And he was the first one to write an article in the Ed Researcher on the Web 2.0. They had researcher being one of the most popular journals in the field of education. I saw him two weeks ago in Vancouver, and he says, I'm doing wiki stuff. I'm, doing, I'm using Moodle. Uh, you know, I can talk about Moodle. Sarah's not going to kill me if I'm on Moodle. And Charles, he says, I'm using Moodle. I, I, I post my lesson plan up in Moodle. You can post it up in course sites just as well. You could use wiki spaces, PB wiki. My students negotiate the syllabus with me. My students negotiate the lesson plan with me. My students sign up to do peer critiques of blogs with me. Students are engaged in his class. Ron is the university professor, or a university professor at York. He runs the Teaching and Learning Center. Uh, if you haven't seen his work, uh, he does evaluation of e-learning. He did a study of the whole country of Canada in terms of blended learning. He's, he's a quite phenomenal guy. Um, you know, like Terry on the West Coast, Ron is on the East Coast up in Toronto. With you questions. Have you edited or written a wiki, um, wiki articles for Wikipedia or in Wikibooks? Has anyone ever written an article? Yes or no? Of course, there's many other people in Canada to read and look at. You know, the Canadians are so far ahead of the rest of the world. People in the UK, we got some people from, from England with us, people from Australia, Finland, Korea. This is what people are doing. I mean, it's not in the U.S. It's, anytime people ask for recommendations, I've got to think about people around the world. Okay, not many people. How about the next question? Do you think it's okay for students to cite our, uh, articles from Wikipedia? Yes or no? Should they cite things? Bit strips, huh? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Oh, yes. No. Yes. This is a heated argument we're going to have here. No! Four years ago, it was definitely a no. Now there's much more balance. Some people say it's OK to use as a starter to get your brain working. But it's not OK to, to maybe cite them in an article unless it's the only source that's available. In some cases, it will be. Of course, many times Wikipedia is wrong. It lists me as an instructional designer as a well-known instructional designer, and I hate instructional design. Okay? I'm sorry if people are out there doing instructional design. I don't mean it's a bad thing. I used to be an accountant. I hate that too. But um, <laughs> I used to be an educational psychologist. I still like those people a little bit. <laughs> Better than to plagiarize. <laughs> ID is awesome. OK, ID is awesome. I love ID. It's the My heart's an ID. I'm sorry. I'm just, kidding. I'm just saying that. Sometimes Wikipedia is wrong. All right, virtual microscopes. My friends, again, at SKKU University, a great place in Seoul, they have virtual microscopes. They can take a look at slides and go in depth in these things. They have, and I'm missing my next slide up here. It's still populating, it looks like. Let me go back. Let's see if this next one will load. This one's taking a while to load, Aziz. I don't know why. But I will skip ahead and see what happens on the previous one. It looks like there's one slide that didn't load all that well. The slide that didn't load is um, a self-testing, having students test the, whether they know the content or not. Okay? And so 4E is a self-test. And it's not up here yet. Maybe we'll come back to it. 4F is virtual worlds, having students in Second Life practice CPR or in Second Life, having a hot tub chat with a guest author like myself, or in Second Life, in a court forum at Harvard, in a mock court system, in Second Life, doing teacher training, 
simulations and games, doing tactical maneuver trainings there in Norway. Right, Major Tom? You probably have seen some of these things at the conference there in Norway this week. Maybe you're presenting on this stuff. Very popular simulation games. Singing summaries of what you learned in the class. One of my students, Dan, sang a song in December on what he learned in my class about Piaget, about B.F. Skinner or whomever. And he had four different kinds or genres of music, more jazzy, more bluesy, more rock in each part of the song. Very cool, and it's up on the web for anyone to watch. The, uh, Prezi presentation. Someone mentioned Prezi. Is that Mitch with us there? Did I see Mitch? It's not my old friend Mitch. Sing along with us, Mitch. <laughs> Mitch Miller. Uh, people love Prezi's out there. You know, having students put thought on paper again. Visualize what they've learned. <laughs> I am dating myself. Oh my God. All right. I better stop that very soon. <laughs> you was laughing at me over here, aren't you, Lou? <laughs> okay. She's laughing at me. All right. So how about the next one then? We've got survey data. So, so you know, student projects like Dan, you can put up on the web for next semester to use. Show students work in action. Some of my students collect data in Zoomerang, SurveyShare, a tool I built, no longer have. Mr. Poll, Micro Poll, polling people like we did to start class. We had, if you got here late, we had 20 polls that we didn't capture, in, uh, but they're in the in the handouts. 20 polls. You know, capture data. Have students capture real world data. Have them write books. One of my students said, Dr. Bonk, I don't like your final assignment. I want to write a book chapter that's in a real book that goes up on the web in Wikibooks or Book Ricks. So she put a book up. She's from DC. Her name is Nikki Hatch. And Nikki put her book up. And hundreds of people have read her work instead of just the instructor. You can go to Scribd and put your work up. S-C-R-I-B-D, if someone could put Scribd up there, uh, Book Ricks, Wikibooks. Uh, one of my friends, George uh, Valencianos from UT Austin, showed me this website a few months ago called Meeting Words. It's like um, Google Documents, only simpler. It's like uh, Wikispaces, only simpler. Everyone has a different color code for what text you're adding to a document. So you can have brainstorming sessions, homework teams, uh, planning meetings, meeting notes, and meeting words. Very cool little tool. Podcast. My former student, Teresa Chen, is, um, is in Taiwan and moving to Hong Kong. And she teaches engineers English by having them sing Beatles songs in podcast shows. She's a very cool instructor. She might be with us here. I don't know if Teresa's joined us here. Teresa, if you're with us. You know, public pad based on Google Apps. Send me that note, Ed. I'll take a look at that. Finally, the last example, student class documentaries. My student, Omida, who had the interactive glossary last semester, this semester created a documentary for my class. She's from Uzbekistan. And apparently, people in Uzbekistan, they like to do more work than what's assigned. So she did a documentary summarizing, my entire, summarizing the entire class that I've taught for 20 some odd years. And now it's usable for new students thinking about the class, doing something with the learning. So reading about it with text, Twitter notes, and open access articles, reflecting in blogs, or reflecting in some other manner, having visualization of the data through maps, or concept maps, or timelines, or poplet, and then doing something in a wiki, or in a podcast show, or in a documentary. There's so much you can do online. Poll number 27. This is not a yes, no, so we'll have to change the type of item uh, of these. Do you think students prefer the do part of R2D2? How many think they prefer yes, maybe, no, or not? Sure. One person's post this week told me she didn't think so. She didn't think students were that kinesthetic. And she wanted my opinion on it. I forgot her name. And, I, and she was happy with my response. So um, if, you, um, if you're posting in the chat window, there is a little tab there right next to where it says main room above the na your name. You can just type, click on the A button and select an answer. I will do this myself. I'm going to add to the poll results here. And there we go. 
So um, we've got yeses and maybes, so quite a few of you there. We still have 252 people with us out of the 300 and some we started with. I want to thank everyone for hanging around for most of the session. We're almost done, not quite. Um, do learn, do learn, do. Thank you, Peggy. A do run, 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 a do run, run. That's going to age me too, I know, isn't it? Oh, shoot. Okay, poll number 28, different type of poll. We'll have to change it to an A, B, C, D of these. What phases of R2D2 do you most use? Which phase in <laughs> Mitch Miller phase? You know, um, who's that guy that dressed all gaudy and so forth? Um, what's that guy's name? He lived a block away from my house growing up. Shawshinka Liberace. Yeah, I grew up one block from Liberace in Milwaukee. Ah, yeah, Mitch Miller, Liberace. Ah, and I'm only 28. Okay, you have to redo the, there we go, we got a new poll there. Thank you everyone for your patience on this one. Read, reflect, display, or do. Which do you like? We got 148 people who haven't selected. Jarl, pick an answer. I know you're from course sites, but Jarl, help us out here, Jarl. <laughs> Becky, Brandy, come on. Farah, Heather, Julie, did you pick one? Leslie, Leslie, one Leslie did, one Leslie didn't. Okay, some of you are doing it now. Now I'm picking on some of you. Patty's got D. Patty Moran has A. Okay. <laughs> Simone, Sherry's got D. Sherry, another guy, Sherry's got B. Okay. Okay, pretty evenly split. Most people on the doing side. Now, let me ask a question. Let's ask this question, clear this one off, and answer it again. The same question, but let's say, in 10 years, or no, not 10 years, let's say in two years, which of these phases would you most like to be using or relying on the most of the 10? Which do you, in, in two years, which do you think you'll be doing? Not what you're doing today, but in two years. It might be the same answer. That's okay. Okay, a little different answers. A few more people on the doing side in two years. So we think we're moving more towards the doing side. Interesting. Okay. Let's, um, yeah, interesting. It's, it's, yeah, definitely. Look at, how, look at how even the first poll was and how, how um, different the second poll is. Okay, let's go on. Remember the text variety model from last week? Yes or no? How many of you still remember this model? Let's go to a yes, no question. Yes or no? We have to change the question type. Sorry about that. Hang on a second. Hang on. Hafiz, can you change? There we go. How many of you remember this from last week? Some of you were not with us last week, and that's okay, so you don't remember it. But uh, <laughs> So this is one way of dividing the web, one way of thinking what's possible. R2-D2, another way of thinking about things, another way of reducing the stress out there, because if there's an announcement, you now have two ways to think about using it, using that new technology, using that tool. Okay? Interesting thing. Well, that's good. Which framework do you like better? A, if it's tech variety. B, if it's R2-D2. This is interesting for me. The motivation framework or the instructional design slash learning style slash learning preferences slash diverse learner framework, problem solving framework. Motivation. It should be only A and B. No C in there, but OK. We'll leave it with C. <laughs> C is, maybe we'll have C be like them both or something. I think we got a C and that's fine. OK, so we got a preference for R2D2. Very interesting. And there is, you know, there's, there's 100 activities that we map out, and actually 200 in the book, because there's a variation on each one. And we have a, a chart with low risk, low cost, low time in there. I hope to give the Tech Variety book away. Maybe people will like that one more than in the end. We'll see. Both will have 100 activities in there. Anonymous voting and assessment seems to be working. Yeah, the voting census seems to be working pretty good in here. Uh, more people favoring the R2D2. Uh, do you feel motivated to try into this out? Let's go to an A, B, C, or D variety. Avis, can you go to A, B, C, or D? Thank you. OK. Motivated to try one of these out. Yes, both. Yes, R2D2. Yes, Tech Variety. Neither. OK. 
Okay. Looks like both. A few people prefer Tech for I, a few people prefer R2D2. Interesting. Okay. Great. Thanks for voting on that one. Uh, how many ideas did you get from today? Well, I have to um, actually. I don't think we have a. I don't think we have a seven-part answer. So uh, <laughs> I apologize for that one. But let's go with um, you know A being zero, um, B being one or two, C being three or four. You know D if you want, and in E being a lot. So from A to E, A being uh, not much, and E being a whole lot, and D and E being a whole lot. It looks like we got people who got some ideas. Okay, great. Okay. Is your brain mush? Let's go to a three-part question here. Yes, no, we're not sure yet. Let's go to three-part. Three-part, change it to a three-part. We'll have to re-poll this. Sorry about that. Go to three-part. Thank you. Everyone try that again. <laughs> is, your, is your brain getting mushy? <laughs> <laughs> My brain hurts. Ooh. Wasn't our Monty Python is going to age me too? Ooh, ooh. My brain hurts. <laughs> I think they put a Kleenex on their head before they did that, and they had these what was called twit races, I think, or something like that. I think Terry Anderson's the only one who probably remembers this, and he, you know, probably was a Monty Python extraordinaire, you know. And I think the guy, yeah, some of you remember this one. They put the little Napkin on his head, and ooh, ooh, my brain hurts. Anyhow, some of you, your brains are hurting for certain, but okay. <laughs> That's the goal. My goal is to make your brain mushy, because if it's mushy, there's more chance for dissonance, more chance for reflection. PG Gumby, yeah, thank you. We got the Gumby, right? Gumby. You know, so. Um, you know, now you can reflect in the MOOC. You can reflect in the discussions and think about things. In the chat window, three words from today. If you're from Europe, what's three words from today? Go ahead if you're from Africa or South America as well. Three words from today that you got from today. Any three words come to mind. Bonk is insane. <laughs> I need caffeine, Maria says. Move on, boy. Move on, boy. <laughs> pop it, pop it, pop it. <laughs> Information dump, dump. <laughs> Podcast poplets and bears, oh my. <laughs> very, 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 very. This has been very, very interesting. Motivation reflecting and blogging. Read, reflect, and do. <laughs> okay. Now, if you're from Asia or the Middle East or Australia, New Zealand, go ahead and type in your three words. Viva la Holland! <laughs> lots to learn and lots to do. Uh huh. <laughs> Uh, watch out. Bonk's coming. <laughs> uh, go away soon. <laughs> You're a jerk. <laughs> uh, send me money. All right. Let's go to Mexico. Three words. Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> okay. Chico, que tengo. Yo lo mismo, chico. All right. Frustrated, engaged, and open. Aha. Uh -huh. Earl Burr, a bet. Thank you, Bonk. Here you coming from Chicago. I didn't say Chicago yet. Or not near Chicago. You're Dallas. Dallas, Dallas, people are beef. You think you're in Mexico. See, the people in Texas think they're in Mexico, you know. How about Canada? Let's go with Canada and the Midwest both. What the heck? Let's go Midwest, U.S., and Canada. We're all one. Let's go northeast of U.S. and the Midwest and Canada because we're all one. It's the, it's the uh, United States of Canada. You know, we're all voting for blue people instead of red people. Papa, enough time. Okay. 
Engage. We need a break. <laughs> Canada for president. I like that. Okay. <laughs> I am crazy. Thank you for pointing that out. We all needed to know. <laughs> all right. Uh -huh. Thank you, Joris. Uh, see ya. All right. Let's go East Coast. Come to Iowa. I've been in Iowa. Clark College. They brought me there and they sent me back. I spoke to 105-year-old nuns when I was there all week. They wheeled them out in a wheelchair. I think one was 120. Okay. They had 80 nuns working there. None were under age 60. Iowa State, you know, when I, uh, uh, University of Illinois, see my friend Roddy on my book. Say hi to Roddy there. He's a good friend. He's from Saudi originally. How about we go with uh, south of U.S., east coast of U.S., and west coast of U.S.? And then we take a break. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Enthusiasm? Well, I hope. <laughs> I present to Beijing in two hours. I hope I have something left. In the tank. Okay, let's take a two-minute reflection break in a second. Don't stop the recording yet. Don't pause. Free stuff. So try the R2D2 model. Try Tech Variety. My notes are in training. Share my stuff up and and so forth. Send me a note. Um, again, these slides are posted at Training Share. If you need them, you can download them. Should we take a two-minute stand-up break? We'll come back for Q&A. Two, three, four, five minutes. Back to sleep. Shaojing, thanks for being with us. Willie, thanks for being here. Taylor, Steve, Sherry, Sandy, Peggy, Mike, Michael, Melissa, Maria, Lynn, Leslie, Chris, Kelly, Judith, Julie, Jessica, Ingrid, Irene, um, Haziz, Ed, Carol, Becky, Anita, Alice, Abby, Abdul, thanks for being with us. Zachary, join the session. Thank you, Zachary. Zhang Wan, you still here? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, we should thank the course science people for put making this available to us. And again, I'll I'll be at the Blackboard conference for the first time ever, speaking on whatever day, Wednesday. So yeah, if you're going to be there, we're going to I'll take some people to dinner or something. So come look me up. It's on July 11th. I'll be there on the 10th. It's down in New Orleans. Never been, so if you've been and you're going, take me. Do you attend ISTE. I'm going to be at ISTE July 27th, or June 27th for a day. I'm doing um, Chris Beatty and our keynoting some institute for online learning. You can, you can look at my homepage and click on news. I'm only coming for a day unless people want me to stay longer. I'm crazy. I'm flying in the morning, flying home in the afternoon from San Diego. Totally crazy. And I got no budget for my hotel. So there you go. Sure. Thank you. ISTE ACT Blackboard uh, Wisconsin Distance Teaching and Learning Conference. I'm taking Terry Anderson's place in August. Thank you, Terry. I'll be doing a workshop with Ray Schroeder, who also has done a MOOC from University of Illinois Springfield. Terry's just left. Didn't hear that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's take a two-minute stretch break. Okay, I'm going to stand up and stretch. You can pause the recording for two minutes. I'll be right back. Grab some questions, Charles. So I think what, so I think one way in which to to make sense of these is to write a plan, to create commitment. Um, the slides for the second session on training share. Yeah, they sh they are up in training share. If you go there, um, and if you can't find them or see them, I will post a link here in the window again. Um, so here are those slides. You can download right there off of that link if you can't find them. In, in, and send me an email if you can't find them somewhere else. This is a colored PDF. It's not the originals. If anyone wants the originals, you will have to send me a personal email to download the, but that's a colored PDF. It's pretty good quality. Charles, are you coming in? 
Yeah, I just wanted to share a question that I had collected from the discussion boards from uh, this week. And uh, we had actually started a new thread on the influence of our own learning preferences on our teaching you know, and our ability to adopt these learning styles. Have you conducted any research on that line or have anything to say about that? How uh, is influencing our face-to-face -face teaching? Yeah, so just the, the adoption of these techniques, you know, the R2-D2 model. So it could be mm. any environment. Mm. Mm. You know, what I see happening today, and we've moved from the awareness and resistance phase to the understanding and use phase. And as part of that, I think that these models and other experimentations have shifted the discussion and dialogue in the language about effective teaching. Every college campus I visit, every school I visit, every military uh, training organization I visit, Major Tom's place there in Sweden uh, is a case in point. Every place I talk to someone or, or reflect with someone, I get a sense that there's, that these new inroads in, in blended learning and fully online have forced people to reflect on face-to-face -face and have changed things, have, have started a, a mass, um, uh, I guess, a large scale projects where faculty work together to reflect on their programs and courses. I mean, you look at active learning classrooms on this campus at IU. I look at um, Yonsei University in Korea. I look at, uh, at uh, in Glasgow, Caledonia, and up in, in, uh, in, in Scotland. Everywhere I visit, there's active learning classrooms popping up. People are, are creating spaces and places for collaborative teams. At IUPUI, they have an outdoor benches uh, in their School of Education. And I think this has all come about because of e-learning, because now we're thinking about teaching in new ways. And so we're not only rethinking virtual spaces, we're rethinking physical spaces as well. Now, the, the part of that question is, have, have people done research on this? There is research on whether teaching online has impacted face-to-face -face instruction. And I think there is some of that. But I think we're pretty much at an early stage here to, to have any definitive statements about it. Oh. Other questions? Is it innovation that equals technology or technology that equals innovation? I would hope that um, any time we're rethinking our programs or our courses, that it, we're being innovative first, but sometimes technology nudges us. It gets our thinking broadened, uh, potentially. Like this week, the Coca-Cola commercial someone sent me, where they have, you can order a can of Coca-Cola for somebody else around the world and see where it gets delivered, and that person can write you a text message back thanking you for buying them a Coca-Cola. Well, that one video got me thinking about how might we do that with tutoring? How might we do that with mentoring? How might we do that with teaching? How might we offer teaching, offer mentoring at will to anybody around the world and have people take us up on it? That distribution of Coca-Cola, uh, I want to build the world, uh, you know, some hope or what, and, you know, what was the name of that song, 1971? You know, I'm aging myself again, you know, with honeybees and snow white turtle doves. Uh, you know, I'll put, I'll, I should put this up now that I've mentioned it. Let me go ahead and, and put the link to that so you can see what I meant uh, by that one. But uh, here's the link to that campaign. Here's the original song. It's a new two-minute ad campaign here and the original. Um, and so that, that's technology. It got me thinking, you know. That, that got me thinking. So, you know, you can, you can click on that first link, you know, and, and, and technology often is the starter. It's the kindling. It's, it, it, but does technology equal innovation? No. Oftentimes technology equals reification. We, we reify the lecture with a smart board. We reify the lecture with a discussion forum. We reify the lecture with talking head videos from the Khan Academy. So not all these things I'm showing you today, I'm necessarily saying, are, are the, 
you know, the greatest that's, that could ever happen. It's not going to transform education necessarily without thoughtful use wrapped around it. To just put videos up is not enough. To just bring a smart board in the classroom is not enough. To just have an iPad is not enough. So what model do you use to select appropriate technology? I use the use model. <laughs> is it, you know, you can use the KISS model. Keep it simple, stupid. But, um, you know, I'm a user of technology. I took basic programming three times, and I can't tell you a lick of code. You know, programming goes in one ear and comes out the other. So it's got to be very easy to use, number one. Uh, number two, it's, it's got to have some, some activity that I wasn't able to, to do without it. So bringing in guest experts from around the world on the fly when I need them for feedback is a unique thing that technology affords. Do you really use, there's the question coming, let's see if I can, you really use a model to select or is the model representing something uh, that's always in the back of your mind anyways? Well, you see, the R2-D2 model is something I've been doing for 15 to 20 years. And so R2-D2, it, it was already happening. And it just, it just came about um, from what I was doing. So, you know, it, it was just through, through my own teaching experience. The, the tech variety came from my reading. I read a lot of literature on motivation and many books. And um, then I, people asked me how to motivate online when we had 50% dropouts online in, in Middlesex University in London. There's, who's ever from London, they asked me to speak on motivation in 2005 or 2006. And I mean, it's 2005, probably. And so I've been speaking on it ever since. It might have been even 2004. You don't stare at the model to come up with an idea? Um, not, r not really. I, I come up with ideas first and then see where they are in the model, to be honest. But now I have 100 ideas, 200 actually, about it. Um, learning from failure. The back page of the Chronicle of Higher Education has an article about learning from failure today. So if you want to read about learning from failure, I think everyone makes mistakes. And that's the place to start. So, you know, I, I did all my homework in accounting two months before it was due, and I knew I got it all wrong. Um, and so there's an accounting question. So, uh, you know, the, there's an article next week on accounting for those who, and, and I talk about new models of accounting. But um, I purposely got it all wrong because I knew I could learn from my mistakes. I purposely did it ahead of time because I knew I could learn from my mistakes. I think we all learn from our initial mistakes. Once you have 100 ideas and the variations, because, because with the variations, you can cross-pollinate ideas. You can take an idea that's a reflection idea, link it with a visual idea, and come up with something new. And I'll talk about that next week, how to, how to juxtapose ideas. Because I'm going to talk about higher order thinking skills next week. I'm going to talk about critical thinking next week. I'm going to talk about creativity next week and cooperative learning. Um, some people balk at the use of too many technology platforms, too many systems, you know, and too many passwords. And so why not pull them on the technologies they're using and start with that? Why not show them the technologies you're using? Why not bring in testimonials from previous students about Wikispaces or some technology you've used that then they won't protest so much because they got a testimonial. They got a peer who says it's good. You know, hey, Mikey, eat it. That's, that's going to age me, too. It's another commercial, right? So, um, you know, if, if your peers have used it in previous semester and say it works, I can bring Yua with me. And Yua can say, it works, right, Yua? Yeah, it works. You know, here, tell them about my classes. Do we, do we, what do we do in my classes in terms of technology? Um, um, like 685? Yeah. Uh, in the class, we sometimes we share our uh, experience, and uh, of course, the assignments is also related with the, ex uh, the technologies. Like we need to uh, sometimes we can create a v uh, wiki books. You can work with others. Of course, you can work on your own. And uh, I like creating a YouTube video that is part of the technology. I think, and um, uh, some of. Uh, us like to create a podcast, a series um, video. Sometimes they even use video to uh, recall their every every week activity. And uh, most of us will use blogs. And uh, we also, uh, our Dr. Bunk would also invite his friends 
like uh, Paul Kim, he gave us a video conferencing and talk about what he did in South America. And he used all the technological tools to help the students there to learn better. And it's definitely extend our um, knowledge. And um, what else? Um, there's, yeah, OK. Yeah, so you know, we, we can bring in someone from around the world, like Paul Kim from Stanford, where he's doing uh, literacy training around the world with mobile phones. And Pomi comes into my class to uh, showcase what's happening. I wasn't answering your question. Being flexible for your students in assignments. So you have multiple options. Have option A and B. Have 10 assignments, pick any four. When I first taught online with returning adult students, I had four assignments like my face-to-face -face class, and they hated me. Then I gave them 10 assignments, said pick any four, and they loved me. The first time I taught online, I had a TA. Her name is Emily Hickson. And I said, Emily, if I t remind them of what's coming due every week, they're going to hate me. Could you remind them of the due dates? So she reminded them of the due dates. The end of the semester came around. They hated me. They loved her. Why did they love Emily? She reminded them of the due dates. They had busy schedules. There's that B word again. They had hectic schedules. So from then on, I reminded them of due dates. You know, there's things you learn over time, right? Fixed assignments do suck. That's right. <laughs> All right. I know yeah. um, a few comments came in along this regard during the session and in, in the discussion boards about at what level of student do you think these, um, this flexibility would work? And the uh, you know, question was, what level of students do you teach? And you know, is there a range that you think that flexibility would work? Or you know, is it all levels of students? As someone who double majored in human learning and human development, so I, I have studied child development, adolescent, and adult development um, in, you know, in my trainings. And being a fan of Maria Montessori, I can say that this notion of choice is alive and well with three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds. If you go to any Montessori center, you, know, you will see the, the assembly of possibilities in front of them. That assembly of choices tends to fall or get lessened over time and then maximized again when they get into to graduate school. And it's an unfortunate outcome of our objectives-based uh, assessments. But we can see kindergarten kids still have some choices. Uh, and I just did a study of K through 6 kids using wikis that I'm happy to share. Uh, so I think the choice is alive and well from age 3 all the way to about age 10. And then as we move towards middle school and high school and even early college, that the, many of the choices are not as available as they once had. But I think part of it's, it's a prescriptive publisher um, pre-designed curriculum. And so when we move away from books from um, Pearson, and nothing wrong with Pearson, nothing wrong with, um, with Wiley. I mean, I love all, you know. Uh, but when we move away from having one book dictate the content, then we have more ways in which more manners in which, more pathways in which students can learn. And so we've been paying homage to a book. You know, this is my book. Don't pay homage to this book. Get rid of that book. Have students have an assembly of possibilities to learn from, right? So Lisa Yoder, a former student of mine, she knows. Lisa's a former, she was in my class. She says, um, um, and I, I'm, I'm, her question came up so quick. Uh, we introduce technology first. Yeah, you know, you have four hats that you wear, right? There's a social hat that you wear, and you want to get people engaged in what's going on in the class. So you've got your social hat, right? And we all have our social hats in, in our classes, the cat and the hat. And so we have that. You want to set, we've got our technological hats, we've got our managerial hats, and we've got our pedagogical hats. And to have students test the technologies first and see if they work. And I've written a couple articles on the hats that we wear as instructors. You know, I had my pirate hat on last time, right? And I, you know, um, but but that there is some truth to the to testing the passwords and see if they work, to to see what technologies work, to see what technologies they need uh, a job aid for. The first time using Wikibooks, it didn't work so well, and the second time we created a job aid, and, and it worked so much better by having that available for them. So uh, testing it first. Test it one time. 
If it doesn't work, try it again with a little tweak. If it doesn't work twice, then maybe give up. It's the first time it's, it may not go so well. And you're right, textbooks high can cost a lot of money, but I'm not saying we need to give up on textbooks. You see, I believe in everything. I believe it's the packaging of everything that's the critical thing. I think we're concierge. Zhang Wan is joined down. If Zhang Wan's still with us, we're expedition leaders. We are uh, tour guides. And so, I mean, that's our role today. We do directly instruct. I directly instructed here for an hour in here with Q&A, right? I made it somewhat interactive. But now the rest of the week is all you. It's what you're doing. The other, how many hours is in the week? Hundreds of hours, right? And then we'll come back in a week after 100 hours of reflecting. I'll have my one week. So, I, you know, 15% of the time should be direct instruction and lecturing. And, and, and then some chats like we're doing here, some polling, some self-directed learning. It's connecting it all together with textbooks or e-books or iPad activities, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's being thoughtful in how you do that. And so, you know, we are going to be increasingly taking on the role of tour guide, taking on the role of moderator of what's happening. Other questions? I see some coming in here. Um, it's hard for me. Jarl, do you want to, uh, here's a question you are saying, um, thank you, you are, can the web just be divided into four activities? What's missing from R2D2? Ah, that's a great question. You notice it's one of the questions we posted in the MOOC. What's missing from R2D2? What's missing from Tech Variety? I think what's missing from Tech Variety is something related to passion, something related to mission. It's in number 10 in goals, um, but there's, there's something about spirit that's missing, maybe from Tech Variety, something, I don't know. What's missing from R2D2, it's hard to say because I've been putting everything in that comes up within R2D2. I think, you know, um, it's, it's really difficult to, uh, yeah, enthusiasm, passion. Someone in that discussion says reading has changed to research. Um, Maybe that's a good point. Inquiry. Maybe it shouldn't be read, reflect, display, and do inquiry, research, slash inquiry, reflect, display, and do. I think many people move to an inquiry model. That's a good point, Charles. Thanks for pointing that out. It's a great point. Um, another question came in, which model do I like between the two, R2D2 or Tech Variety? I like Tech Variety because it's simple, and, it, and I like I mean, I, I mean, I like R2D2 because it's simple, and, but I, 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 I think R2D2 holds more psychological water. There's more psychological underpinning for the tech variety model. It's, it's more complicated. <laughs> Other questions? And uh, Kurt, I'm not sure if the research goes into this at all, but a couple of folks had asked about how the model addresses any accessibility issues, you know, particularly with the kinesthetic or the, you know, the do or the visual, where you might have some visually impaired or disabled students. Yeah. Uh, yeah I was at a symposium at AERA in Chicago about six years ago, and when, that was when, uh, maybe it was five years ago, it was when, 2007, so yeah, it would be um, April 2007. And it was when Second Life was getting hot, and, and virtual worlds were getting hot. <laughs> there's more than one way I guess we could take that comment if you've been in, I, I'm not a second lifer, but anyways, there's going to be some chuckles after that. But anyway, there are a lot of pop people using Second Life, and, and people ask the question about universal access and, and ADL compliance and so forth, and the first person or first two people that got up and stood up to talk were people who had two different types of disabilities, and their comments were on how Second Life addressed them so much better than any other technology ever had. Uh, in the past. And in fact, we've got Kelly in here, if she's still in here from my class. I'm not sure if Kelly's still in here, but Kelly, if you could post the link to the video you did. I guess she's gone now. But Kelly did a video in my class this semester on how Second Life can increase access for people. But there were some guidelines needed on, on how to help them get access. So while it was a tool for equalizing things somewhat, democratizing the classroom, there were some extra job aids that had to be created for them. 
So um, in terms of autism, um, I've seen some research or at least some announcements about iPads and, and my daughter's worked with a couple autistic kids who are six, seven years old, how iPads impacted their communication skills in a positive way. And I'm seeing increasing numbers of uh, research studies about how autistic kids, or not necessarily research, but at least anecdotal data on, on autistic kids using the Khan Academy, catching up in their schoolwork, how they're using iPads, catching up, how people who are visually impaired, for instance, might have access to contents because it's been magnified online or because they're using a draw screen reader online. Here in my classes, the R2D2 model in particular has an impact on me because I have a visually impaired student in our library in information science department taking my classes and we make sure the content is made available for her in the ways in which she can access them. So by having multiple forms of media, and if you go to my blog post for this week, I talk about multiple modes of media. Hearing it, seeing it, reading it can address these different modalities in, in new ways. So that's a great question, but I think actually R2-D2 fits right in. It, it's, it's a model for people teaching with special populations. Uh, it's one way of, of doing that. I would definitely think it, it addresses that. Autistic is most likely to learn. Um, I'm trying to read, it helps kids focus. Some of these technologies do help with the focus. Some having a reward structure built inside of it. If you look at a couple of these videos from Volkswagen um, commercials where they're, they're going up and down stairs with piano keys or they're recycling their trash, um, you, if you haven't seen these videos up there, you know, their theory of fun. I mean, it's really about games, you know, and, and focus. If we can get kids to focus, if it ha happens through a game, great. If it happens through a challenge, great. If it happens from reflection, great. I, I, you know, I'm all for it. I believe more is more. I never believe less is more. My liberal colleagues here in the School of Ed believe less is more. And I'm an educational psychologist. I know all the working memory studies. I've read them. More is always more. I'm an accountant. I believe in learning environments. And what Course Sites is doing, what Moodle might be doing, what Desire to Learn people might be doing, you know what here at IU with OnCourse, we're creating learning environments. And, and you know, there, thank you for the link, Stubbs number four. Calming people down. You're right. I mean, there is something about attention grabbing, calming someone down. We've got, uh, we're at 6 o'clock here. We should probably field one or two last questions in here. Yeah, Carl, I'll just, I know there's a couple of folks that asked, I don't know if you wanted to clarify your statement about your dislike for instructional design or that you don't ah. believe in learning preferences. That came in a bit earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can actually definitely clarify that. Um, the reason I don't like instructional design models is keep in mind I was trained in models that were very prescriptive. And I have the office next to, next to me is Dr. Charlie, can we make the R2D2 table available to select activities? We can try and do that, yeah. Send me an email, we'll, we'll. The chapter one has one of the tables, it has the first table. And I can look for the table two in the last chapter. Chapter one's on the MOOC, it's uh, Josie Bass said we can put it up. So I was trained, and, and, and I had the green book from Charlie Regaluth, who now has the office next to mine. And Charlie shifted his notion of instructional design since 1986 to today, when I first started in the field. And so there's an opening up. But my training was in very step-by-step -step linear models of instructional design. And linear models bore people. I came out of the field of accounting. It was a linear model. We went from 1,000 students in our first year to 200 at the end. It was, you know, there, there's, we need more, I, I have a consultative model of instruction in week three articles. You can read about a different approach to thinking about things. I think Tharp and Gallimore's book from 1998 is a must read. It's called Rousing Minds to Life. It's written for K-12, but it won awards. And it's about a model they call instructional conversations. They have 12 components. Some of them are behavioral. Some are constructivistic. Some are cognitive. I could, I, I'm trained as a constructivist and a cognitivist, but I actually believe everything works. We have to find models like an instructional conversation that make the learning environment rich and engaging. 
And so I don't believe in instructional design the way it's been bantered about or been uh, promoted as well as bantered about uh, because it's too slot step. I believe in models that are um, systemic, that are multifaceted, that are recursive, that are um, more learner-centered than instructor-centered. So the name of the what's the name of the book? Ra, Ra, I just typed it in. I took uh, Shifang's coming. Are you still in China, Shifang? Rousing minds to life. Let me type it in again. If you didn't get that, rousing minds to life. And the authors are Roland Tharp and Ronald Gallimore. And they studied the Kamehameha schools in Hawaii uh, back in the 1980s. And I, you know, there are many books today you can get, but this is it'll give you one way of thinking about how instructional design should be. It's one version of it. And I think it's a rich version. It's, it's definitely wedded to the apprenticeship camp, the situated learning camp, the constructivist camp, but it also has behaviorism alive and well in there. So, um, you know, I know many MOOCs have focused on connectivism, and um, that's fine. Um, but um, Tiagi is another place to go. Yeah, there's a, there's a website you might go to. THI, thank you for mentioning that, Lisa. Um, my friend Sivasalam Tijarajaran, who is a former faculty in my place. Um, you has met Tiagi, right, Yua? Yes. What do you think of Tiagi? Your brief, briefly. Uh, I, um, I think Tiagi, he's really good at game design, and you can use a game to motivate your students. And uh, I tried one of his games in my volunteer teaching, and it's really working. You can just uh, go to the website, Dr. Bank Sen, and it's really great. Just explore it. Tiagi's parents wanted him to become an engineer, so he purposely flunked the engineering exam so he could become a teacher. He's a very interesting guy. Uh, he comes up with one game a day, and he makes many of them free on his website. So he's like he's 190 years old or something, I think now, but um, he still looks like he's 42. So he's a great guy. And if you haven't been to his website, um, Tiagi at Tiagi.com is his email, I think. In fact, don't don't tell him I said that. Leanne is with us here from Melbourne Deakin University. I assume that's you, Leanne, but it doesn't say for sure. Welcome from Melbourne. She's studying mobile there. I see Julie's still with us. Gretchen, I don't know if that's Gretchen from here at IU or a different Gretchen. Yeah, Tiagi has a different belief in design. That's a good thing. If you look up Tiagi and go to um, and go to Google. I'm not, and, and watch his videos about his beliefs in instructional design. He thinks we should throw out all instructional design models. But you know, which models do you place? Uh, which models instructional design place someone at the center, the center of learning? Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, my stomach tells me I need to eat. Which models? You know. The kind of apprenticeship model, if you read an article from 1988 on situated cognition from Brown, Collins, and DeGued, it talks about, and the Tharp and Gallimore, Rousing Minds to Life, mention the same thing. There are ways to assist in learning, not just directly teach, but if you find this 1998 article or their book, uh, The Social Life of Information is a great book about people fixing Xerox copiers and how the water cooler around them. I mean, this is sort of Maria's dissertation there at ASU, right, Maria? So you know, um, that article talks about six ways in which to facilitate learning. We can push people to explore. We can foster articulation and dialogue. We can get people to make explanations. We can question them. We can manage the learning environment, and we can directly instruct. I've come up with 12 to 14 ways to teach. Those are six of the ways. We can also weave discussion together online or summarize. Um, we can model right, our own ideas. Uh, there are a number of things that, that you can do to get an environment that's focused on apprenticeship and learning and getting people who are novices in to um, reflect on what they've learned and to push beyond that. 
course, evaluations will show growth. If you focus on the dynamic nature of learning and assessment, you will find your assessments should be, I mean, if you focus on personalizing the learning, you should have better evaluations of it as well. And that's why I think your question earlier, that's why I think tech variety of the two models is the better model. Even though R2-D2 is simpler, uh, in the end, the tech variety model links more to that situated cog piece from Brown, Collins, and Tagood. I think our 2D2 model, for those of you who are in instructional design, and, or and the other problem I have with learning uh, styles is that it, we focus on people's strengths and don't build on weaknesses often, you know. So I think we should we should be sure we should have kids select things that they feel comfortable with, but we should also be looking at what they don't feel comfortable with and getting them to try something new out. Otherwise, we're going to be stayed within our small space and, and, and always do research papers on, you know, um, circus monkeys and never do a research paper on elephants, you know, because we, we know a lot about monkeys. You know, if we, if we only give choice. Barbara left the room. I don't know. We've, okay, we've got a few people left, 78 people left here. We had another question for me. Um, how do I operationalize R2-D2 in the future? How do we operationalize it? And Jarl has a question. Go ahead, Jarl. I was just going to let you know, I know it's 10 after 6 and you have another event coming up, so it's totally up to you if you want to address that last question or, or I didn't have anything else yet from, from my perspective. You know, I think what we've done in the book is provide guidelines and that's one way to operationalize the model. Uh, we've provided a number of examples. That's another way to operationalize the model. Uh, we've provided variations, uh, and and the model itself is a wheel. It's a problem-solving wheel. So if you think about your instruction and look at it from that standpoint of that wheel, uh, that should hold in the future. Uh, I'm hopeful that both models will still be applicable in a decade, in a century. You know, as opposed to my world is open book, and you've got a copy of the book here. You know, you may have seen the world is open book, and in there I have a model called We All Learn. That model will not hold for a decade. There'll be new stuff coming out because that was a, that was a model created, created with the technologies for today. R2-D2 and Tech Variety are created based on the pedagogies for today. Hi, Gwen. Thanks, Gwen. So that's why I think they'll, st they'll have more st staying power. I think the R2-D2 and, and Tech Variety will last much longer than the, than the We All Learn model. That's, that's my opinion, anyhow. Okay. Any final comments or questions? Thank you, Todd, for hanging around. Thank you, Xia uh, Jing, again, and Xu Fang, and um, Paul, Carson, Carson Daly, Maggie, and Leslie, and, and Chris, and so forth. Thank you, everybody, and if you should probably say goodbye. and. Um, and yeah, it's been great being with everyone here. So uh, hopefully I, some of your questions were answered here. I realize I can't answer all of them in the discussion forum. I tried to do what I can. Um, my semester just ended, so um, <laughs> it's been kind of crazy. So it's Michelle Deschler, not Mark Deschler. I thought it was Mark. Sorry about that. So you're not coming from Australia. Okay. Where are you coming from? We should probably have uh, one last time everyone p uh, type in what city they're coming from and what time it is, their city and what time it is. That might be a good one to end with. Ah, 8 a.m. 2 a.m. in Homer. It can't be 2 a.m. in Homer. Brussels, 1 a.m. 8, 12 a.m. Troy. Who's coming from Troy, New York? I've been there. Columbia. Joanne, good to have you here from Columbia. Just talking about, I just talked to the St. Louis Dispatch person. They'll be in the Sunday paper if you get the St. Louis Post Dispatch or whatever it is. There'll be an article about virtual commencement and other things. Australia, 8, 12 a.m. in Australia. That's a good time. 
Maria Pavis Corris. Are you coming from Spain? 1 a.m. Where are you coming from, Maria? Greece. Okay. All right. Cape Town. Midnight there. Kim's coming from Bloomington. Kim's one of the TAs, interns, helping out. Thank you, Kim. Kim does five times as much work as what I ever asked her to do. So um, she did a game show for her final assignment. I should post it in the window if I could find it here. I don't know if I can find it, but uh, yeah, I had her up last week. So fascinating game show. Homer's 2.13 p.m., not a.m. Oh, okay. I thought you said a.m. Thank you, Lynn. KSA, Kingdom of Saud, Hala, 1 a.m. I was there a year ago, almost at this time. Every April I tend to go there. This year they're tired of me. <laughs> In Dubai, right, Mark? Are you still with us, Mark? Mr. Mark? I don't know if Mr. Mark is still with us here. I think he's gone. I think Major Tom is gone. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll talk about thinking skill stuff. Hopefully you're liking the articles that we're posting and discussing. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you again, uh, Kurt, and thanks, everyone, for their attendance.